Thank you very much. Good morning to those in the room and uh, those joining us online. Welcome to this seminar on, and more specifically, to our symposium <laughs> at CAFSA. This is an annual event that we have started about three years now. This is our third uh, symposium. And today the topic is Transboundary Pest and Diseases of Concern to CARICOM Countries. We are here at the in the Bahamas at the Caribbean 17th Caribbean Week of Agriculture. And we hope that for the next uh, 90 minutes, we can share with you some information on these uh, very important uh, pests of disease of concern to CARICOM countries. The reason why we chose this uh, topic is that, you, as you will see as we develop the uh, topics today, these diseases can cause severe economic impact to our countries. For example, African swine fever is present in our region, as you would know, on the island of Hispaniola. And it, does, it can cause, and it has caused devastating economic loss to those two countries. For those countries in the region that, um, of that the pork industry is an important sector of their agriculture. It is important, therefore, that we try and prevent the further spread of this disease to the, to the region. We have TR4 and also the giant African snail, which is in the region, in some of our member states, and as uh, as causing um, severe problems, and also little yellowing of coconuts. The coconut industry is an important sector for the region, also. So this disease and looking at its impact is an important part of this um, session today. So with that, I will introduce Ms. Dion Clark Harris, the representative of Jamaica for the Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institute. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Well, ladies and gentlemen, my role here this morning is very brief. I am here to welcome you all, not just the persons in the room, let me recognize those online. And it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the planning partners of this morning's session. And these are namely the Caribbean Agricultural Health and Food Safety Agency, CAFSA, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture, ECO, the Caribbean Plant Health Directors Forum, which we call CPHD, and the, my own institution, the Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institute, CARDI. Now, all four organizations contribute to safeguarding the region from the introduction of this introduction and spread of pests and diseases that are of quarantine importance to countries in the region. Over the past couple of days, we have had sessions addressing aspects and initiatives relevant to enhancing the region's capacity to move co agricultural commodities safely within the region. Now, this is a major concern that is moving agricultural produce which would include planting material from one country to another because there's a potential 
to unintentionally introduce new pests and diseases. So I'm hoping that some of you would have visited with some of the sessions that we have had where we underscored the importance of pests and diseases as we trade um, and the implications for the 25 by 25, 2025. Pests and diseases will be a major decider as to whether or not we recognize our target with, in, with respect to that. So this session will focus on transboundary pests and diseases. And these are defined as being highly contagious and transmissible, and they can spread to new areas and regions across national borders with serious socioeconomic and public, as well as animal and plant health consequences. Within the region, there are emerging and existing pests and diseases concerns, and some of these we elaborated on in the previous sessions, and these have the potential of impacting the food and nutrition security goals, as I mentioned, economic development and trade, and also very importantly, the ecology of the countries. Now, Dr. Peters already named the, the diseases that we are focusing on for this session, but I'll repeat them for those who just came in. We're going to look at the African swine fever with a focus there. Fusarium will tropical race four, which is a threat to the region. Um, bananas, well, musa species. And lethal yellowing of coconuts. And we hope to discuss the giant African snail, which we're probably so familiar with, we're taking for granted and we shouldn't because it can continue and will continue to spread if we do not implement measures. Now, ladies and gentlemen, stakeholder education on these threats and interventions to prevent their introduction and spread is critical to mitigating the risk. If we don't know what we're dealing with, we're losing from the beginning. We all, all of us, and it makes our job a little easier, I would say, as plant protection specialists in the region, and of course, animal health protection specialists, that we have experienced firsthand and learned lessons from the rapid and far-reaching effects of a highly transmissible viral disease called COVID-19. Those lessons should underscore that we have to be equipped with knowledge and robust systems geared towards prevention, early detection, and mitigating measures to prevent our food and nutrition security in the region. We hope that the presentations today will equip us with that knowledge towards this end. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Welcome to the session. Thank you very much, uh, Dion. And now we will get right into the meat of the matter, as, as they say, with an introduction of transboundary pests and diseases by our own specialists, Juliet Goldsmith. Hi, morning, everyone. Just a second, so I get my clicker. <laughs> All right. This works now. All right, so nothing I'm going to say today, I think, is a surprise to anybody. Most of us are, are specialists in the field, whether we're in animal health, plant health, or even food safety. But this is really just to put things into context for us to understand why we're talking about transboundary pests and diseases today, and that is plant pests and animal diseases. Oh. Okay. 
some reason it's going blank. All right, so very briefly, an introduction to the introduction. We will look at some definitions, really some trends and impact of just two organisms and a little bit in terms of a conclusion. Right, so pretty much what Mrs. Clark Harris, Dr. Peters said before, the movement of plant pests and animal diseases across physical and political boundaries that we, I mean, within the region, outside the region, do threaten food security, agricultural development. We understand the impact on trade and the unmentioned COVID pandemic. We had really serious global concerns. What are they? The very general definition, something that we heard before, animals and plant pests and diseases refer to organisms, and these are the transboundary animal and plant pests and diseases that will spread across national geographical, including physical boundaries. And that's just a very, very simple and general definition. But if we were to look a little bit more specifically at what are transboundary animal diseases, shortened TADS really, because we like acronyms. And these are usually defined, and this is the OIE FAO definition, as those epidemic diseases that are highly contagious or transmissible and have the potential for very rapid spread, irrespective of national borders. They can have serious socioeconomic and public health consequences. And the definition, if we're talking about plant pest and more acronyms, TPPS, and these are those migratory insects, but they could also include, of course, arthropods, weeds that spread across several countries, causing significant crop losses in this case and damage to local biodiversity and the environment. And we heard about giant African snail, but I think most of us in the plant health community know about the, the fall armyworm. Right, and means of spread. Again, factors that affect the entry, establishment, and spread of these organisms are globalization. We know that one. Human population growth. We also understand that environmental forces such as climate change and ecosystem diversity, as well as international trade and human movement, which is probably one of the most significant cause of, of spread. Right, just, just two examples, and including probably a little bit of the impact that these organisms have had. First example, the desert locust, maybe the most widely known of transboundary organisms. And this has been serious organism, serious threat for what we're talking about, centuries. We talk going all the way back to the locust plagues in Egypt. Um, the most destructive migratory pest, a swarm can travel 90 miles per day and have 80 million locusts. And these guys can consume the equivalent of 35,000 people per day. That's how much food they eat. And so some of us who are a little bit older will remember the 2003 to 2005 outbreak in West Africa. And that would have caused like about 2.5 billion worth of crop damage affecting 8.4 million people. And to, to eradicate, well, not really eradicate, but to end the, the plague, it costs up to $450 million. And these are US dollars. And the most frequent, pre, sorry, most recently, don't tie it in the morning. Most recently we have an outbreak that I think most of us are a little bit younger are familiar with. And this is an estimate because I think for the most part, this is still ongoing. There are still um, swarms that are popping up and affecting crops across East Africa, Yemen. But this is just one little bit of data where the World Bank estimates that like in 2020, 
in East Africa and Yemen alone, losses amounted to as much as 8.5 billion US dollars. And so we're not, I mean, I deliberately chose one that we're not going to discuss today so that you would have had more than one examples by the end of the day. So on to animal diseases, and please remember, not an expert on anything related to animals. And we have many vets in this room. So I, I chose Newcastle disease mainly because you've, you've been discussing African swine fever all week, and we will talk about it a little bit later. And because we really, really love our chicken. Uh, but as the data says, at 37% of global meat production, chicken meat, poultry is the leading form of meat consumed in the world. And so any organism that is going to impact on poultry production and the food we eat is going to have significant impact for us in terms of food security, et cetera, et cetera. The Newcastle disease itself is, is highly contagious. Um, and really death can occur within five to seven days of, of infection. So other impact that we're talking about transboundary pests and diseases, we have biodiversity loss and an example, sorry, I used an, a plant health one because that's what I'm familiar with, but Zylella fastidiosa, which is mostly found in Europe now, uh, threatens forest biodiversity in many, many regions of Europe. And it is not, um, we're not immune to it because it does affect things like coffee and we have coffee is very important for us. So Zylella fastidiosa is one of those that we are constantly on the lookout for. We, we mentioned before that one impact is on trade restrictions. So whether we're talking about animal diseases or plant pests, we understand that most of these organisms are regulated by, by member states and by other countries. They're usually quarantine pests or what is the word we use when it's an animal disease and we're regulating it? Notifiable disease, right. So, and once that has been reported from your country, in a lot of cases, or should I say most cases, we can expect some set, um, sort of trade restriction or at least um, phytosanitary or sanitary measures that we would now have to comply with. And last but not least, the livelihood of farmers are severely affected. And I just, well, I said I was going to talk about TR4, but I couldn't help myself. Um, single outbreak of TR4 in Mozambique put like, 2,000 local jobs at risk. And I mean, I chose it mainly because we had the data. And the expectation is that were it to be introduced into our region, we are talking about way, way more than 2,000 jobs. So finally, um, for now, conclusion one, the challenges are becoming more and more important. Two, Prevention and preparedness are critical to safeguarding our region and our industries. Risk assessment, risk management, and risk communications are very, very, very important. And I specifically include risk communication there because sometimes the perception of risk of these organisms can blow things way out of proportion and allow, and, well, at least cause us to put in place interventions that might not even be necessary. One, two, three, four, sustainable funding is critical, it's, it's vital, it's something that we must have in place. And finally, and this is, I am looking directly at Dion when I say it, research is absolutely necessary to address the gaps that we do know that we have in prevention and management of these organisms. And so thank you very much. In case you need additional information, that's me. Uh, oh, conclusion, sure. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Juliet. And, uh, I asked her to go back to that slide because that's the crux of the matter. 
What are the recommendations? Prevention and preparedness are critical. We learned in our um, ASF meeting yesterday and on Monday that you could pay now or pay later. So I think it is better to pay now because when you have to pay later, it the cost is a lot more. You know, we sometimes we like to go and shop around for prices. You go on Amazon and you see the price today and you say, no, nah, I'm going to wait until a couple of days to see. And when you go back, it is, you lost that opportunity. So let's pay now. Risk analysis in general. She spoke of risk assessment management and Yes, thanks. Yeah. Funding. This is the most critical issue because for you to do any of those others activities, you need money. And last but not least, and my colleague across the research, <laughs> she's whispering to me, we need money. Yeah. Exactly. So let's remember those um, conclusions and recommendations as we go through the other presentations. The presentation on African swine fever, we have... Uh, Thank you. We have, um, as Juliet would have mentioned, we have been talking about this the entire week. So I'm not going to be boring you again with a lot on African swine fever. Suffice to say that it is a very um, devastating animal disease. Uh, viral disease that cause or it can result in almost depending on the form that you have, whether it is a for acute or the more lethal form, you can lose 100% of the animals, of your animals. Or even if it is um, subacute, you can get up to 70%. And that is of your pig population. I was looking through some, some um, data. And for example, Vietnam in 2019 lost 6 million of um, its uh, pigs, almost 20% of its pig population as a result of this disease. So when it enters your country, um, it causes uh, severe dev devastation to your pig population, and it is not whether it's in the in the industrial um, production or in the backyard production, which is more common across our region. And we all know the importance of those uh, small farms to our communities or to the livelihoods of the persons involved in that production. So for our countries, it is important that we keep this disease from entering because of the devastation that it can cause. I am going to use this format because we have, uh, as Juliet said, we have a number of vets in this room. And so if you wish to share any other information to, to um, apart from what I would have said, to emphasize the point on 
the importance of this disease and its spread across the region, feel free to volunteer or I will start to volunteer you. So <laughs> quickly, Eric. I've been volunteered. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Gavin. Eric Eder from CIRAD. Uh, just to add to what you've said, uh, usually we said uh, that ASF is not uh, a zoono zoonotic disease, so it's not really part of one else. But in fact, due to the impact on the livelihood of the population, it, it becomes uh, a one else concern. And um, the other thing is just you were talking about Vietnam, but we could talk about China also. And uh, you can multiply by more than 10 the figures that you gave. And another thing is that, uh, and this is a real one else concern, when the the population of, of pigs decreased by an half uh, in China, there was a worldwide shortage of insulin. Because in fact, the world production of ins insulin is coming from pork, uh, from pigs in China. And at that stage, there was a, a, a huge shortage. So it has an impact on, on, on human health. And the other thing is the impact also on, uh, on crops production. Because there was this dilemma between our economic war between China and US at that stage. And it was of the benefit, in fact, of China, because when they had a decrease of their pig population with all the impact on their own uh, human population, that they, they stop importing uh, maize and other crops from US. And it has an impact on the world uh, cost of, 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 this, uh, of these crops. And it was not only affecting US and China, but the world, the world, the whole world. So I think we have to keep that in mind, even if obviously at our uh, scale in the Caribbean, we have no such amount of production, but the impact on the population and the, the livelihood of people, the bans and the impact of for all the region, in fact, would be uh, tremendous if we cannot control the disease and avoid its spread from Hispaniola. So there is also a, a, huge, uh, a huge need in terms of helping Hispaniola in controlling the disease. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so we were taken a little bit by surprise, but as you mentioned, we were talking about ASF during the whole week, and I think all the vets present in the meeting, they are already sensitized about the importance of the disease. Uh, based on what Ms. Juliet said previously, I think it's quite clear that the importance of transboundary diseases and transboundary plant pests, it's increasing uh, time after time due to many reasons, globalization, movement control of humans and goods, and beside climate change and everything else. Gladly, regarding African swine fever, pigs still don't fly, so we have this advantage on the control, but it's still it's quite challenging to control. Uh, you mentioned Vietnam, China. We also have many examples in Europe, Asia, or even here in America and Africa. And we see that even countries that doesn't have lack of resources, they still face a major challenge to control and eradicate the disease. So as you mentioned, the prevention is definitely much cheaper than trying to control and eradicate the disease. And we know that at this stage, having ASF already present in the region, we need to improve the prevention me preventive measures we have based on the control, the border control, uh, the tourist, touristic activities that sometimes also bring risks. Of course, it brings profits to the countries, but also brings risks that we need to take into consideration. Uh, we need to think about biosecurity in general. Usually we think and we focus a lot on the industrial production, but we need to keep in, in mind the backyard farmers, the small productions. Usually they are the most impacted and also is the higher risk that we face in the countries because we need to have a good communication strategy to reach those producers. We need to know how to, how to create the conditions to make them our allies in the 
prevention and the control of diseases and in the detection of it. They need to trust in our policies. They need to trust that we are on their side and that we are willing to help to prevent for their own goods and also for the, the good of the economy of the country. It's also important to keep in mind that we are dealing and talking about a disease that doesn't have a vaccine vaccines available. So once it's in the country, we need to implement a lot of measures to control it, but vaccine is not an option. We saw, again, bringing COVID as, as an example, how the vaccines, they, they were a, a game change for us to deal with this pandemic. And this is a, not an option for us with ASF. So one more time, I think just highlighting, preventing, if needed, detecting as early as possible to, to reduce the impact of the disease when it incurses in the country, I think it's the best measure for us. But I think most of us are already kind of sick of hearing this today, so I will stop here. Thanks, Gibby. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, we can, you will. Hopefully you're going to volunteer me. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ryan and Sam Dominica. I think the oh stand okay, thank you. Oh, I have to. Oh, we are live. Okay, I think part of it. I'll be brief. Is the risk communication is is well, it's good. But I think one of the critical components we have to put in a conclusion recommendation is information and communication in the context of public awareness, because we can prevent, we can put all the measures, but the public awareness is critical, how we inform policymakers and, and people involved in, in, in thing, the consumers. So I think part of the, the recommendation should be a, a strategy in terms of public um, campaign and how we prevent these transboundary diseases. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> Yes, Sam, and lastly, we are talking about reducing our food import bill 25 by 25. If we are very serious, we are thinking of paying up now so that we can do our surveillance and monitoring so that, so that we don't have to pay out later. Thank you, all colleagues. I think um, this format has really enriched this debate as it relates to African swine fever. Because we would have, uh, as I mentioned, we spent all day on Monday discussing this disease. And then we had that advocacy uh, meeting yesterday morning, um, speaking to the ministers um, and to sensitize them on the importance of the disease and, and paying now. <laughs> and <laughs> Except if we don't, we will have to pay later. And seeking uh, how we can assist our colleagues in AT. Because the disease is present there now, how can we, as a region, be able to develop our systems and, and, and uh, so that should it, first of all, that we can respond and assist our, our colleagues in AD, and uh, also should the disease, God forbid, move to another of our member states, we can be able to respond in a timely manner because that is another um, one of the other problems with this disease. The longer you take to respond, it will continue to spread and then it becomes endemic in your country and it, the difficulty of controlling it then becomes a problem. So as uh, Katie spoke about the surveillance, if we are able to um, strengthen our surveillance system, uh, uh, having the means to detect the disease early, having the systems in place that will incentivize our farmers, those back uh, to report when their animals start to get sick and don't hide it. Um, then we can be able to, 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 to deal with the disease in a timely manner. That is an important aspect as it relates to this disease. As was shared, we don't have a vaccine for it. So if we don't, we're not able to control it. Normally, the, the method is by stamping out or killing the pigs. But if you that is only um, successful if you're able to detect it early and, and apply that measure. After it gets spread into the entire country, stamping out becomes a problem. Thank you. 
Go ahead. A mineral, um, Jamaica. Um, uh, my concern is regarding um wild pigs. So many, much attention is um put towards um wild pigs out there because I know that's a source of transmission. Very good question. Um, for those country who have um that as a a, a threat, it's it's a, a mechanism. That is one of the, the problems you have in Europe, for example. But in our countries, um, who may have populations of wild boars like Guyana, it, that then becomes an issue. And that, the, the, how you deal with that? Because Guyana is huge. I don't know what's... We can go and find all of them and try to kill them. So prevention in that case is the best remedy or solution as it relates to that. Don't let the disease come in because if it comes in and gets into our wild pig population, you could understand the impact. And we do eat wild pig, so it's a source of, of, of meat for the indigenous populations. So with that though, I think we will, because we have three other um, diseases to speak about, we don't want to dominate the um, the session. So we will stop there for now on African swine fever. And I will invite Dr. Wayne Myrie to present to us on lethal yellowing of coconuts. Dr. Myrie. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. I wonder where comfortably I can stay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> stay right here. <laughs> I stay right here. Um, we had an issue getting here on time, so I must apologize for not getting here on time. We had a taxi issue. One came, uh, didn't come. Then we had a very um, a lady who is a Jamaican who decided to take us here. So for that, we're grateful. <laughs> um, the my presentation is on. Uh, lethal alien disease. I'm um, sorry for the pest and disease um, to topic there, but it's not actually a lethal alien disease. Where is the... Okay. All right. So just a trivia. Why is coconut a seed? Uh, coconut is, is a seed because it is a reproductive part of the tree. It's a fruit because it is a fibrous one seed jupe. For those who don't know that coconut is a fruit, it's actually a fruit. Um, it's a nut because it's defined as a nut is a one seeded fruit. Um, so coconuts. <laughs> We have many diseases in the region, and yesterday I went through some of them. It's a pictorial representation of the diseases in the region. Um, you have the lethal alien disease, blood rot disease, leaf grace, relief spot, untrot nose, red ring, heart rot, horoka, not fall, gomosis. Then you have, for pests, you have the American palm weaver, larvae, you have Rhinoceros beetle, armyworm, moth of coconut caterpillar, coconut caterpillar, coconut moth borer. You also have red palm mites, ambrosia beetles, scales, coconut gall mites. In order of importance, the lethal alien disease is what is important, mostly in the region. This is the lethal alien disease. This is the effect of the lethal alien disease. A brief history of the lethal alien disease. In the region, in 1834, in the Cayman Islands, it was first discovered. In 1884, in Jamaica, in the western end of the island, it was known as West End Bud Rot. That was in the Montego Bay, St. James area. It then moved in 1961. Uh, to Buff Bay in Portland. It's about a hundred and something kilometers away, hundred and something yeah, kilometers away. 
um, and it then spread to the traditional coconut growing areas in Jamaica. For those who know Jamaica, it would be St. Thomas, Portland, and St. Mary. And it wiped out nearly 9 million Jamaica tours. That variety was a dominant variety at the time in the country. Where is it at the moment? All the red X is there. That's where the disease is at the moment. Uh, the last place we found it is in Martin, St. Martin, both Dutch and French St. Martin. Um, um, so that's the area that it is at the moment. But you have lethal diseases in Africa, um, which is similar to the lethal LN disease here in Jamaica. How do we make that distinction between those in Africa and what we have here? is by the 16S rRNA gene, which is a molecular method, method that we use for disease identification and characterization. How do we identify the disease? First of all, we use uh, molecular tools, and I just put Entrot nose there just to illustrate a point. And this is Entrot nose um, in coconuts. The pointer don't work, right? <laughs> so this is untrot nose in coconuts. Um, of course, for the untrot nose disease, we take a piece. We then grow it up on agar. We have the nice mycelium growth on the agar. We then look under the microscope and we make a diagnosis as to what we are seeing based on the sporulation and so forth on the fruiting body. Um, but we can take this uh from here, take up a, a, a piece of this, all right? We can then extract the DNA and we can do um, PCR. And after we do the PCR, we would determine whether or not we have the disease, uh, the untrot nose. Um, using uh, the PCR actually, uh, identi the primers actually identify the, the, the disease. So for phytoplasma, it's found in the phloem of the coconut plant, uh, which is the nutritious area. How much minutes do I have? 15? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, the diagnostic method for the lethal alien is when we're doing the diagnostic work, we collect samples from LY infected trees. We use an, a brace and bit, as you can see in this picture here, all right? I have a mechanism that I use. I don't need anybody to come with me. I just clip it onto the tree, put the bag in, use the brace and bit, get the trunk bit out into the bag. You put that onto a cool pack and you take it to the lab. So the DNA extraction that we use is called Dole and Dole with some modification to the protocol. And then we use uh, PCR looking at the 16S rRNA gene. We also have other genes that we looked at as well. The GREL, right, HIM and so forth. And then after doing the PCR using primers, P1, P7, which is the universal primer for identifying phytoplasma, we use a nested PCR using this primer um, and after doing that, then we do what we call um, RFLP, Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism, and characterize uh, the phytoplasma that we found in the sample. So the results of that can lead you down this path where you're looking at um, samples that you have taken and the samples that we have taken have revealed that we have variation in the phytoplasma in Jamaica. And that variation distinctly uh, have a difference in the, in the samples that we look at from Antigua, St. Martin, St. Kitts, and Florida. So in Jamaica, we have seven, well, one, two, three, four, five. We have five different what we call haplotypes, right? That we can find in the various areas. And each of those haplotypes uh, has in it 
uh, when you see it in the field, how it is expressed. So you see it's, a, it's it is either aggressively expressed or it is not so aggressively, it's mildly, mildly expressed, which means that you can have the disease being aggressively moving to the, through the field and you can, can have the disease mildly moving through the fields. And then we use a tree, um, phylogenetic tree, to uh, put the samples where they are to get them into the clusters that we, where they are so that we can know exactly what they are similar to. Insect vector identification is also important because insects are vectored to the disease. So the phytoplasma cannot move to another tree by a mechanical uh, means. It has to be moved from one tree to the next by a vector, right? Um, this vector is Haplexus scrutus. So when we are doing um, our insect vector identification, um, we, we look at morphological uh, characteristics of the insects, first of all, that we have collected from the field, and then we use molecular tools, cytochrome um, oxidase subunit one. We also look at the 18S uh, RNA gene, and that will give us an indication as to whether or not we have something new or we have, um, we're looking at insects that we have found before. And also we do a phytoplasma um, detection method on the insect as well. So we're talking about the lethal alien disease. This is what the symptoms are. Premature not fall, necrosis of the inflorescences, yellowing of the leaves uh, and the telephone poles. So you will drive around the country and see telephone poles. Doesn't mean that those trees actually died from the lethal alien disease because every disease that affects coconut tree will lead to telephone pole. Even um, senescence uh, will lead to telephone poles. Transmission of the phytoplasma. Um, it picks up the, the, in, the, the phytoplasma from infected tree. Within the phytoplasma itself, the, within the insect itself, the phytoplasma starts to multiply. The phytoplasma cannot be transmitted if there's a, not a multiplication in insect. So the insect is also a host for the phytoplasma. After that multiplication takes place within the insect, it moves to the salivary gland. And that is why when we are actually doing um, our work to find out if an insect is a transmitter of the phytoplasma, we'll take the salivary gland to look at it and also to do PCR work on it. So it's in the salivary gland, like the mosquito, transmit malaria, same mechanism. It goes to a, a healthy um, tree and it infects the healthy tree. By the way, I can't get uh, malaria. Why? Why do you think I can't get malaria? Yeah. I am a sickle cell trait. Um, the reason why we survive, the Africans survive, is because there is an amino acid or one uh, variation in my base pair in my uh, hemoglobin molecule that cause my cell to be sicker, partially sicker. And the plasmodium cannot live on the sicker cell that I have. So I can travel to Africa <laughs> and don't get malaria. Management of the lethal alien disease is important because it can only be managed. There is no cure for it. So what's the management strategy? The first one is monitoring of coconut trees 
identification and removal of the trees, replacement of the LY removed trees, effective weed control, and you will see why this is important later on in my presentation, and timely and adequate nutrition. Because of this management strategy, at a farm in Jamaica, 80,000 trees, 700 acres, we start collecting data there from 1992, no, sorry, 1999, but we actually start recording the data since 2002. Over the years that we have recorded the data, we have troughs and peaks. But the, what I want you to get from this graph is the fact that this farm has lost 1.5% of the population since we start collecting data there because of the practice and management that we have instituted there on that farm or the farmer has instituted it on the farm. So it's quite possible to live um, with the lethal alien disease and we have farmers that are actually doing so. Another farm, same thing. Now I spoke about the cultural practice of removing the weeds. You can see here that this fellow which I have discovered, it's a new insect that I have discovered, and I have named it Ecleus maca springi. Maca, because it, there's a particular characteristics on, in the insect that we have found that has a prickly type, and I want to Jamaicanize it. So I use a patwa word, maca, and springi is from Spring Garden, where I found the insect. This is a 66 such species in the world. It's nowhere else, just in Jamaica. And you can see this, they're here enjoying themselves. They are carrying out a sexual activity on the leaf, making sure that they produce, reproduce. Here is after eggs have been laid and getting into part of the life cycle, the larvae and so forth. No, this is on guinea grass. Now, if I am going to control this insect, that is the potential vector for the lethal lilian disease. My cultural practice here is to make sure that I remove the weeds. Now, I can, all do, I can do this organically or I can do this inorganically. Now, I am a promoter of using not too much pesticide. So I'd prefer to go the organical way. So we did experiment in Jamaica using vinegar, higher concentration, Epsom salt, and liquid soap. And this is a sort of burn that we got after 24 hours. No joke, all right? So we use this to remove the guinea grass. So the life cycle of the insect is broken. This fellow here, is no longer our problem because we have already removed the guinea grass. So we don't, he doesn't get to this stage where he can make the transmission for the phytoplasma. You also have natural enemies. We found out that the lady beaker, which is a godsend for almost everything. And then we found a mite, we found a spider mite that the spider, sorry, that actually, uh, and you know, sometimes when you go to the field and decide to look around, it's just by chance, you know, we found these things. Believe me, because I was just in the field and I saw this uh, uh, situation. There was the spider eating the Eclos Maca Springy, literally eating it, right? Then we have the for part of our management practice, we have to use tolerant or resistant varieties. Now I'd say tolerance because most of the varieties are actually tolerant to the disease that are tolerant to disease. And we, in our subset in Jamaica of the Malayan dwarf variety, we found a subset that is actually resisting the lethal alien disease. And this subset is actually very good. Um, and it produced large nut size as well. Don't tell me my time is up. <laughs> we have, we have multivarietal field, um, plant, 
plantings as well that we use for the management of the disease. So within a field, we say you plant Malayan dwarf, maypan, uh, maypan, maybras, braypan. Then you have indicator plants. Now those indicator plants are actually more susceptible than the coconut plants. And those indicator plants are like the fan palm. So if you plant fan palm here, it is expected that the fan, fan palm will come down first with the disease, which will give the farmer enough time to practice the management strategy, which is necessary to reduce the spread of the disease. Identification of the vector. This is how we do our vector, uh, our insect collection using aspirator, aspirator or sweep method. This is my colleague from the University of West Indi uh, University of Florida, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Hemlick. And we have trials in the field where we use, we collect the insect, put them in this netted cage, allow transmission to take place so that we can determine whether or not the insect is transmitting the disease. For morphological variation, we look at the head, the wings, and the reproductive structures, and also the anus. So those are the four we found. This is one that we found, new insect, new species. The second one, Aplexus fornicus, not fornication, fornicus. <laughs> Agubini, um, Patara. That's the other one. And of course, the Eclos Marcus Springy. All of these that we have found are actually published in Zootaxa, one of the renowned uh, entomological journals in the States. And the work was done by myself and colleagues from the University of Florida. Those are the articles that were published. For the first time since the 1970s, we have had a significant decrease in the disease in Jamaica. No other time, because of the research efforts that we have undertaken over the years that we have been looking at the disease. So, conclusion. Over the years, using research, and we go back to research, right? It's only research that you can impact these things not by chance, by research. After you do your research, then chance will help you. <laughs> but you can't start with chance. You have to start with research. Increase the knowledge of the disease through research. We have identified variants of the lethal LN disease, which is fully established. We have identified, identified vectors, five such, and those were published. Um, we have five strategies which we use to manage and significantly reduce the disease. And we take into consideration all of this that mitigate against the spread of the disease. And we try to be flexible by adopting other strategies as well. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Those are the persons who help with the research work. And if you need a coconut climber, because the trees are too tall, which I have heard yesterday. Jamaica can help you with it. I can't climb a coconut to save my life, coconut tree to save my life, although I'm from the rural areas in Jamaica. But you notice, it's me that on your right climbing the coconut tree. Thank you very much. <laughs>
we didn't really check for grass specificity, but um, we know that it, it can broadleaf, because you know broadleafs are generally the problem. We know that it can also burn broadleaf as well. Hi, very informative presentation. Great research. My question deals with the, the molecular detection of the vector. Um, these target sequence you use, that's just for identification. But has any research been done where you use the vector to try to detect if there are phytoplasma within the, the vector? Thank you. Very, very good question. Yes, we do. Um, we actually, you when we look at the, 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 the when we first identify that's a new vector um, or a potentially new vector, we actually excise the salivary gland and, and look at the salivary gland. Now we have a feeding technique that we use because um, the, re the reason why the insect is actually feeding on the coconut tree is because of the nice sugary sap that it can obtain. So we mimic that and we put a dye in it. So we have a, a method that we use where you have a petri dish. On the petri dish, you have a membrane. The green dye mimics the greenness of the leaves. If the insects are actually hungry, they're actually going to prick the, the membrane. In pricking the membrane, they take up the, the dye. It is expected that by pricking the, 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 the membrane, they're also going to release the phytoplasma into the liquid. We then harvest the liquid and do the PCR work on it. Thanks. Thank you. Last question. Uh, just a quick question, Dr. Murray. Um, you have several species of uh, plant hoppers and different variants of the uh, little yellowing. Is any correlation that particular species transmit particular? Um, but before you answer, I just also want to acknowledge something uh, very important that we have to recognize commitment and persistence of coconut industry board in Jamaica as a farmer's organization to keep up with research. And this is the result. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for that question. Very good question. Um, we have not yet gotten there, but we are going to get there. So that's one of the research objective for this work and trying to tie in if there is a, if all of the insects transmit all variant or they transmit particular variant. Thanks. And thank you for your comment uh, um, or the commitment of the Farmers Association uh, towards the, the work that is going. And that is a similar um, commitment that we got uh, yesterday from on some of our other collaborating partners as it relates to African swine fever. With that, we have to move on um, because we only have 25 minutes more. And our next uh, presentation is from Mr. Nelson Laville, the chairman of the Musa Technical Working Group of the CPHD Forum. He is online. And so we will turn it over to Nelson to present on TR, Tropical Race 4, TR4. Good morning, everyone. Um, Nelson here. I am not seeing on the. I am not seeing there the um, the icon to share. Okay, I found it. Great. <laughs> All right. Um, let me know if you could see my screen. Yes, Nelson. All right. Great. Maybe put it in presentation mode. Thank you. Yes. So thank you for having me. Um, unfortunately, I can't be over there, but um, TR4 is very important and very dear to my heart. Um, 
over since 2017, we formed the group, um, the Caribbean Plant of Directors um, Forum, Musa Technical Working Group, because TR4 became very important for us. And as um, the discussion is today, it's, it's a transboundary disease. Slides are not moving. Okay, so um, today I will be presenting, um, as, as Gavin mentioned, we only have 25 more minutes, but I'll do that in less than about 15 minutes. We'll introduce the disease, we'll speak of its spread and its proximity to us. Um, its impact, its potential impact um, to the Caribbean region, um, work that we've been doing in partnership with our agents, with our partner agencies to um, strengthen the exclusion initiatives, activities, and of course, some of the recommendations coming forth from recent activities that we've been having, which I'll mention later in the presentation. So TR4, um, Fusarium oxysporum forma special cubensis, um, tropical risk four, or as they say, in, uh, as we say for short, FOC TR4, or just basically TR4. Um, it's a fungal disease that has um, been affecting Cavendish varieties, um, mainly, but also affect all other Musa species. And um, just a little background, TR1 is what actually disseminated with, with destroyed um, the Gros Michel, which was the previous variety for export that was being grown throughout the, the Caribbean and Latin America. So how does TR4 um, move and, and how, how does it affect the plant? It first, it's a soil-borne disease, um, soil-borne pathogen, and of course it enters the plant through its roots and populating and uh, multiplying within the vascular system creates a blockage that later on um, blocks the vascular system, as I mentioned, and causes wilt and eventual death of the plant. Um, the, the fungus has four, um, three reproductive um, structures, the um, microconidias, the macroconidias, and the cladimospores. And these, the last one that I mentioned, it could last up to 30 years, survive up to 30 years in any infected soil. TR4 cannot be treated. Thus far, there are no fungicides or fumigants that could efficiently um, destroy TR4 once it's in the soil. And so this is, um, and, and I've been following the discussions from the first presentation, and we seem to have something a lot in common. Um, the African swine fever, there are no vaccines, with um, lethal yellowing, there's no real control except for management of the plant. So um, TR4 does have that similar characteristic and um, the disease, the pathogen could lay dormant in the soil for up to 30 years based on research. Um, earlier on, I mentioned Gros Michel and RIS1. This is just an outline of the different tropical races and subtropical races of this disease. And um, the varieties listed here, um, Gros Michel, Blogo, Heliconians, Cavendish. And you would notice the green indicates some level of um, resistance. The S in red represents susceptibility. And you would notice that all of those varieties listed, they have proven high susceptibility to TR4. I should note though that in, in our region, the Caribbean region, we predominantly grow 
Cavendish varieties for export and for our local consumption. We also grow and export plantains. Um, we have a very active um, ornamental plant um, business in the region or trade in the in the region, and it is also uh, um, susceptible to TR4. And of course, our indigenous um, varieties such as the silk and 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 the others. Just as to give you a, a, an idea of the spread of the disease, it, it started off in Southeast Asia. So the, the indication, as you would see my, um, the, the laser pointer, that's where it started. And of course, spread through Southeast Asia, which we know is um, very high production areas for bananas and plantains. Um, then moved on to, to um, East Africa, in Mozambique area and um, Mayotte, these areas. And of recent, it has been introduced into to the Americas. First, we had a discovery in Colombia, then a discovery in Peru, and most recently that of Venezuela. So, Based on the, the notification coming from Venezuela, we were able to look at it in context of the Caribbean region. And um, we have two of our um, sister countries who are bordering with Venezuela and have both active commercial and non-commercial movement of persons and goods between these countries, um, therefore the vulnerability. We also have to pay in, we also have to take, take into consideration that we have these, our ABC islands, which are in cross cl close proximity as well and have active trade with Venezuela, um, Peru and Colombia. And these countries also have very active trade with our overseas territories such as St. Martin, Seba, um, St. Eustatius, et cetera. So it's just to, this, this, this slide is basically to give us some context why it is so important and why are we in the phase of a red alert. So how can this disease move? As I said, it's, 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 it's uh, airborne and it does not need a passport. So soil, planting material, debris, and I should, I placed the photos specifically there in terms of the planting material. Research has shown that TR4, once they, they um, cannot be moved via um, tissue culture stage three planting material, once the laboratory respects the proper index, um, disease indexing protocols. We have a very active trade in terms of movement of used vehicles, used equipment for farm and for construction, also used tires, um, and of course, debris on your shoes and, um, and illegal movement of plant and material. These are all um, pathways that the, the, the disease could move. And of course, recently I should I should mention we had this um, this group of partners where we did a, a, an analysis and to see how this could possibly impact the region. And uh, coming from this, we would have um, developed a, a policy brief to help um, advocate and build awareness among policymakers of the region and some of the the take homes from this analysis will have the impact coming from farmers. Of course, um, we have Dominica, Jamaica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Suriname actually being listed um, in the top 100 exporters of bananas in the world. Um, this is you might say a hundred, wow, a hundred, that's not significant. It is very significant when you have others um, such as Ecuador um, leading the, the, the production. 
And so our farmers would definitely be impacted by the, the introduction of, of TR4 in the region. As I mentioned, it is, it is um, a soil-borne pathogen and of course um, can stay in the soil, can survive in the soil up to 30 years, meaning that a farmer would, on, would be unable to produce um, any economically significant crop of bananas or plantains or the other species of um, of Musa, and therefore affecting his income and his livelihood. Processors are the other um, stakeholders that would be significantly impacted. We will take, for example, Jamaica, um, who produces so many different um, goodies from, from bananas, the planting chips, the banana chips, the flour, et cetera. And of course, the lack of raw material would mean that the, the farmers cannot source locally and may have to import, which eventually affects the, the bottom line of that farmer, um, that, that processor. The exporters, of course, um, as I mentioned before, those countries being at the top in the top 100 of world producers, St. Lucia, Jam um, Suriname, Jamaica, Dominica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we will be unable to export bananas, not, be not only because of the loss of productivity and the loss of yield, but also it would may it may be uh, an action that is taken by our importing countries to safeguard their own borders. And so would discontinue um, trade with these countries who are infected. And um, of course, importers um, unable to get um, bananas and plantains within the region would be forced to go out of the region. Um, just to highlight some data, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Guyana, St. Kitts, Trinidad and Tobago um, have imported roughly up to um, 10 million US dollars in, 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 in bananas. And of course, most of that would be coming from the region and, and within the CARICOM um, group. And so TR4 entering the region would of course impact at all these levels. And of course, consumers. Imagine um, you're unable to have one of your um, traditional meals of fish and bananas or um, those of us who enjoy some banan peze or a lovely broth in Dominica with some um, bananas and, and fish, you are unable to, to have that. Um, and then speaking, of course, of the agro-processed products, you are unable to access this um, within, within your country or within your region. So the, the threat of TIO4 is a real one. It is very close to us. And of course, the, the impacts would be felt along every bit of the value chain and within every sector. And therefore, we need to continue to safeguard the region, um, promote exclusion of these disease from the region. Um, so just, just a few um, deficiencies that we've been able to identify at the technical working group level and the CPHD level is that we need a strengthened legal framework for the region. Not only speaking of using this as a platform, of course, TR4 as a platform, but this, this goes to all transboundary pests and all pests of quarantine importance. We also need to strengthen our local phytosanitary capacity. Um, in, that, in that context, we're speaking of laboratory capacity. We're talking about inspection capacity. We're talking about the, um, the ability to do the field surveillance and, and monitoring and capturing of this important data, as well to look at contingencies for social and economic fallout. As I mentioned earlier on in, in the different sectors that would be impacted due to an in, in introduction of, of, of TR4, um, we're speaking of significant economic losses and impacts to livelihood. And of course, we need to start looking at the the contingencies and alternatives to ensure that you know um, we do not have such 
significant impacts. And of course, to build resilience within our corporate systems. So our partners who have been working with us tirelessly from day one has been CAFSA, CIRAD, CABI, ICA, FAO. Um, we've also had significant support from the USDA, especially um, UWI, um, CARDI, um, uh, OILSA, and of course, working um, with the Higsby group, we were able to draw from the experiences because within Higsby, you have a number of countries who have already been um, infected or the disease has been introduced there. And of course, the movement of that information is so important for us. Their experiences have, have been helping us um, in terms of preparedness. Um, so preparedness, how, how do we do the exclusion and safeguard our borders? Um, declare and notify the pest, declare it a notifiable pest. Um, and speaking of the legal framework, you ne we need to have countries declare it as a notifiable pest, which of course would trigger um, actions to be taken at a local level, a national level, and also regional level. Strengthen our biosecurity at the ports, installation of mats and signs. We need to do that so our travelers are aware that this is um, an important disease and we are working on exclusion. Increase national surveillance. Inform and educate inside the public. Um, earlier on, mention was made um, to this specific point that sensitization of the general public and all the NPPOs and other partners um, is important. And strengthen the capacity of the plant protection units within countries for detection, exclusion, and management, um, not only within the, the plant protection units, but also the farmers who are the ultimate people who would be impacted by that. So farmers need to be trained capacity building. And, and, and the strengthening of national and regional diagnostic capacity. Um, just up to recently, um, last year, we did not have yet a, a laboratory uh, regionally that would be um, capable of doing, give it, uh, producing certified um, accredited data in terms of diagnostics for TR4. So all of these capacities needs to be built in order to ensure exclusion and early action if the disease is ever detected within the region. So readiness, um, create, creating and activating a TR4 response team. I think we have something to that level already at CPHD and CAFSA level. Um, but that needs to be strengthened and not only for TR4. Um, yes, it's a TR4 presentation, but also as the chair of the Caribbean Plantive Directors Forum, there are other pests that we are interested in and of course the wider region. And so this should be considered for other pests of importance. Um, engage in simulation exercises and emergency response. Just recently we conducted um, one in partnership with Orelsa and CAFSA and, and ECA and our other partner agencies such as CIRAD in doing a detection simulation exercise in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, it was a successful um, simulation exercise with a lot of, of, of information to, to further region. Currently, we are in the process of exploring the establishment within the region of promissory germplasm that has some level of tolerance to TR4. And some of the countries would have been engaged thus far. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, stage three um, in vitro planting material is not a pathway for, once the indexing process is, is done well, um, is not a pathway for TR4. Um, so this, activity um, we we anticipate would be um, would be completed by the end of October. Supporting the implementation of um, priority actions in the region, 
and also um, through support through development of the national action plans. Thus far, through the CPAG and projects that we've, we've done, we've been able to um, provide or support the development of 10 national action plans across the region. And um, this, is, this is as a follow-up to a regional TCP that FAO would have um, implemented um, two years ago, where a regional action plan was developed 40 years ago. Earlier on, um, Gavin mentioned um, a phrase, pay now or pay later. And um, this is one of the approaches that we've taken also at the CPHD. Um, normally, usually, we, those who are involved in the science of it, the management of it, the understanding of risk communication and all of these things, um, we are the converted. But usually the unconverted are those who do not see the cost and benefits of doing action now or doing pro, do it, take, taking proactive action as opposed to reactive. So one of the plans within our, uh, with the short term plans would be to do a full assessment to look at the financial, economic and biodiversity impacts um, should TR4 be introduced in the region and to show what we need to do. If we do now, what would be the cost? And if we allow things to get out of hand and have to do later, what would the cost? So this is um, us attempting to champion not only um, actions for TR4, but also for other transboundary pests and diseases, and also those that are quarantine importance to our members. Recommendations moving forward, um, reinforce, reinforce our border control systems, declare TR4 if it, it, it as, a, as a priority pest, which means it would trigger some level of national level and also at the regional level. Um, we're asking actions, recommendations to come forward as to the provision of um, the prerequisite financial and logistic support for programs of these types, um, support the NPPOs in developing national action plans. Um, some, of course, 10 of them have been done and we're, we need some more completed. And of course, um, to enhance the RPPO CPHD Forum and international organization to the development of, 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 um, of responses to that threat. Um, the, the recommendation moving forward is that we need that support um, across the board, from the policy level down to the farmers, um, we need that support. Of course, I mentioned earlier on, um, this is what uh, a field um, in, infected with TR4 would look like. And that is, I think, a photo from a field in Colombia. And, and imagine, uh, our settings in the region where a large farmer um, of bananas or plantains is about five acres. So imagine a five acre plot being infected with TR4 and there he has to do some eradication actions. Um, imagine how, how that field would look and imagine um, the impact to his livelihoods and, and, and our food security. Um, so this is the end of the presentation. Um, I thank you for listening and um, being part of the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelson. And we have uh, time for a few questions, if there are any, or comments. Good morning. Good presentation. Um, one question, the border security um, component. How do you intend to target um, our guests? I under, I can appreciate the mats, but how do you get those shoes that are in the luggage? Most people, most people will be carrying those dirty shoes in a plastic bag in their luggage as opposed to wearing them on the plane. I think we may have to consider... Um, 
some education in our tourism market area, which would require a, a combined effort at a regional level. I don't think any one Caribbean country want to pay <laughs> foot the bill for that, but we, it's something we may have to consider. I just want to reemphasize that while we are securing our borders and uh, clean planting material, oh, sorry, <laughs> yes, uh, while we are securing our borders and uh, planting material, it's very um, necessary, but there is a weak links uh, in relation to the layout of the farms in the Caribbean. Uh, our farms are small, but they are mixed crops. So what happened that from time to time, unintentionally, um, various uh, farmers' association, various groups have exchange of farmer to farmer from other countries. Sometimes as a technical teams come in and it is not necessarily relating to banana, it could be cocoa, it could be any other crop. And therefore, uh, unintentionally, uh, people might introduce because this particular disease is soil borne. So we do have um, that area to be addressed, right? Not only tourism, but actually technical people who come from other countries in relation sometimes to the very same um, diseases. I also want to mention that it was in a presentation of Dr. Lavin, but importance um, for the Caribbean countries who are dealing with horticulture or a lot of people, especially uh, traveling and they bring uh, smuggling, actually planting material, pay attention to Heliconia. Heliconia is a host for TR4, and Heliconia is the only host for mocha diseases as well. So, and we do have experiences in Jamaica that mocha actually came most likely through the Heliconia, which had been um, imported, smuggled probably, right? So um, we have to pay attention to those things. And the last comment, I noticed that the conventional soil fumigation with conventional pesticides, not as effective, uh, maybe we should try solarization because that might work, especially with the temperatures in Jamaica, I mean, in Caribbean, right? So those are my comments. Thank you very much. And can you introduce yourself so we know who is this? Okay, uh, Marina Young, Jamaica, uh, Rural Agriculture Development Authority. And one more comment, the Heliconia is also the host for the red palmite. So if uh, somebody don't have red palmite, be careful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Um, my question, I noted that, um, as my colleague said, that Heliconia is a host. So I was wondering if you were also um, in your surveillance programs using that, because then that is a plant or a floor that is used for the um, flower ranging industry. And we travel a lot when we are going to like the World Flower Show and so. So Nelson. Okay, so um, first question um, with regards to the to the um, the dirty shoes, etc. It's it is broadening the information distribution to customs and um, other border control agencies. Um, uh, as I mentioned as well, data and um, is important for for doing that sort of advocacy and 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 information distribution, and so I should mention that um, Kabi, under one of its projects, is is going to be looking at risk associated to passenger luggage, and that should be rolling out very shortly. Um, and the risk would be would be not only TR four. Um, associated with TR4, but also with, with other um, pest of concerns um, for the region. Um, with regards to the heliconia and it being a pathway, yes, heliconia is a very prolific um, host um, for, for a lot of the diseases that affect um, Musa species, um, even so viruses. Um, and so we have been um, we have been also mentioning within our communications of the risk involved with heliconias. Um, of course, 
we need to do a little bit more work in terms of speaking with those involved in the um, the horticultural trade, because heliconia will not show um, disease symptoms of TR4 um, for a very long time. However, Cavendish will show it. So heliconia can be infected with TR4 and not show it for a period of time, um, which is a lot longer than what the Cavendish or the others that are susceptible to it um, can will show. And so um, it's surveying, using it as part of the surveillance activity might be a bit difficult um, unless if you find it in a field where um, it's already showing symptoms. Um, surveying for the disease um, on non-symptomatic plants or even through soil can be very tedious and very costly. And um, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, within the region, we are still very deficient in terms of um, doing that kind of diagnosis. Um, but with it, during our simulation exercise, uh, we had a discussion on, on diagnostics and um, there are quite a few promising um, protocols and, and techniques that are coming up. And we hope that within the 2024, we can promote them a little bit more within the region. Not sure if I covered all the all the questions, but um, to my recollection and my notes, uh, I think I did. Thank you. Just a, com a comment. Okay, when I talk about the Danny Grenadines. One of the things very much concerned and it's very frightening because Venezuelans are moving in droves. They walk straight up to the US border, pass through several countries. The other thing is when they read what you have in your airport, they're already in a country. So we have to be concerned about the awareness program that Venezuela has, that the, the people from Venezuela don't bring out the disease to the country. So we have to ask them to launch such a campaign to prevent it moving from Venezuela or Colombia into the Caribbean. Call of the King, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, just to reiterate on the point of uh, engagement, uh, almost all of us have some banana in our backyard. And when we have many eyes, uh, it can help in the strategy for, you know, monitoring, just to ensure that that, that aspect is paid some attention to. But Secondly, I, I see the, we're looking at management, but I think we need to consider the what if. What if this thing gets through? What do we do then? And I haven't heard much in terms of the looking at uh, resistant or tolerant uh, varieties of disease, uh, but uh, bananas, banana, most of species. But I think we need to do a lot more work along this line uh, because the impact, economic and social impact, can be huge. You can have huge crisis coming out of this, particularly in the banana producing and exporting countries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Brian Critchlow from the Cayman Islands and former chair of the Caribbean Plant Health Directors. I just want to iterate what Nelson was saying. We, we've already looked at this in the Caribbean, especially with our heavy tourist-driven economies, that, you know, mats and disinfection at airports are virtually a, a non-starter. Um, but where the key is, is biosecurity on farms. We have to really work with our farmers to enhance biosecurity on farms, who is coming on their farms and making sure that they maintain programs where people just don't walk on, especially in countries where you may have agritourism mixes and people visiting that, that is going to be a, a very key component. And I know um, Nelson, I want to stress also the what Nelson was saying about the rapid identification. Lack of labs is a big challenge for us right now going forward. And I know Nelson can touch on um, research in terms of resistance, but one of the challenges I think for the moment is a lot of those indications is to find a variety that's both resistant and acceptable for consumption in terms of flavor, profile, et cetera, of bananas. But it's a very serious disease and something that we really have to focus on and can't say enough in that area. Thank you.
quickly. I just wanted to ask if there's a lot of emphasis to on the movement of soil and if it can, uh, movement of soil through the region and so if that can be a problem. Yeah, we'll take that as we take the last question or comment. Right, um, Damien, Jamaica. Um, I just want to, another question, but more of a comment. Um, play, we need to place emphasis on the illegal channels. Because most time the commercial channel is not really the, the the problem or the big source of a problem. So the illegal I know in Jamaica we have more than fifty illegal entry points. And we have to be monitoring. No, as the NPPO, we alone can't do it. So we have to depend on um collaboration with customs and JCF, that the police or and um the defense force to have these borders the entry points monitored on a constant basis. Uh, the public awareness campaign needs to be ramped up seriously. We need to pump money into the awareness program because we need to tell people the impact. And I have to stress it. You mentioned that Venezuela need to do something, but as your country, you need to do something. And you need to do more aggressive work than what Venezuela would be doing. Um, and lastly, to control disease, take money. And we have to be serious about this. We need to set aside budget, um, contingency um, budget to deal with this when it comes. Um, so we can't just sit, wait, um, and just write a plan and put it down. We have to put the, the, the money where we need to put it. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your comments and questions and active participation in this session uh, this morning. Um, we have a lot. Um, uh, Nelson mentioned the common thread throughout all of the presentation in that most of them, um, not most, all of them, there is no real treatment. Um, the means of spread is actually by movement of people or, or, or um, materials, the vectors. So how do we combat these? And number one is public awareness. We have to be able to educate our farmers, our travelers. You ladies, especially those who are gardeners who like our flowers, when you go and you bring... Um... <laughs> no, it's not <laughs> They, I go start a war this morning, and that that was deliberate. So, but anyway, just the movement when you go, don't bring something and say, "Oh, I will sneak this in in my luggage." We need to educate all of our travelers the importance of not doing that. The money part of it, we started out by Juliet speaking of of the need for having money and budgeting for it. Those, the, the heads of the NPPO, the heads of the competent authorities across the board, whether it's the animal health, plant health, food safety, when you budget in, part of your job is advocating for that money and let it be um, um, set aside to be able to deal with these diseases, prevention rather than cure. And other aspects that we spoke of, the legal framework in our countries a lot of times are lacking. So these things that were mentioned, we have to ensure that they are put in place. I want to thank, we were supposed to do, yes. Let me finish and then I'll give you. We, we were supposed to have a presentation on the giant African snail. Actually, our colleague, she was stuck in Miami. She has not yet arrived. <laughs> but we were going to have a, just a general discussion on it. Uh, time really doesn't permit for us to do that. I was going to mention the presenters. What we will do is to make their um, contact information available. For, so for those of you who would like to continue the discussion, and I'm sure Dr. Mari, for example, will be uh, here at least. I'm not too sure. I'm, you won't be leaving today. So if you can um, continue the discussion with him. And... Uh, Juliet and the others, 
all of the vets that are around there. We we are out of ASF. We've spoken a lot. So, but if you have any other in information you need, you can contact any one of us. And um, I really want to thank you for participating in this event this morning, and thank the presenters, uh, all of you, and all of you who um, gave comments, gave uh, gave um, your questions. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Yes, I only I only rise on an important matter. I I don't generally rise after the chairman, <laughs> all right. But I I think it's important to mention for developers moving large coconut palms um please in your respective countries it is not something good to do um i know of an incident where a country got lethal alien disease just because they move large plants from another country to their country all right i just think it was important to mention that thank you very much so it's it is indeed an important point. So once again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure this uh, um, for you to be in this symposium, and we look forward to next year when we will uh, continue this series. Yes, thanks. Good. The next one. For those um, our board members, we continue in the, the adjoining room uh, at 11 o'clock. Thank you.